Um, now, it's quite uh, appropriate that I'm following the sovereign draw because I too am going to begin my speech by reading out a long list of numbers. So at least any train spotters in the audience should be well catered for, but please nobody shout bingo halfway through. So here we go. 27, 32, 44, 41, 36, 40, 100, 153, 134, 113, 119, 97, and 91. Those numbers, ladies and gentlemen, represent the public sector deficit in billions of pounds over each of the last 13 financial years, including the current one. Of our £1.4 trillion national debt, around £1 trillion has been run up since 2002. Uh, and that's hardly something to boast to the grandchildren about, is it? Uh, the deficits run up by Gordon Brown when he was Chancellor were, in my view, particularly inexcusable because they happened in the economic good times. They may have kept the trade union sweet and smoothed Brown's path to number 10, but they left Britain particularly vulnerable when the crash struck. Uh, and of course, Brown and his key advisers, a certain Mr. Balls and Mr. Miliband, said they had abolished boom and bust so it would all be fine. Well, that worked out well, didn't it? Uh, and now they want another turn. Uh, well, I think the British public will be giving them a rain check and not a blank check. Uh, and then George Osborne took over. And to be fair, George has performed like a pretty decent darts player. Every time he goes to the fiscal Oki, he averages about 100. The only problem is that's another 100, mil 100 uh, billion pounds on the national debt. Mr. Osborne started out with good intentions. He told us that by about now, the deficit would have disappeared. Uh, I sometimes think that he saw that David Cameron had his own special promise to break on bringing net migration down to the tens of thousands. And he saw that Andrew Lansley had his own special promise to break on no more top-down reorganizations uh, of the NHS. So he thought that he wanted his own special promise to break as well. So he pledged to get rid of the deficit in a single term and set about doing no such thing. Uh, when he told us we were all in it together, we hoped it meant that he was serious about prudent finance, but it turns out he was just reminiscing about his days in the Bullingdon Club with Boris and Dave. <laughs> but you know, the really irritating thing with George Osborne, having fooled us once, he's looking to do so again. He says that by the third year of the next parliament, he will have made deficit disappear and be moving into surplus. Well, you know what? That is actually a perfectly sensible aim for whoever is Chancellor after May the 7th. So let UKIP MPs be the ones who help to make it happen, who hold the feet of the next Chancellor of the Exchequer to the fire on that Treasury deficit elimination plan. No more backsliding, no more reneging on pledge pledges, no more 100s on the fiscal oki. UKIP MPs will be the much needed voice of fiscal responsibility in the next parliament. And we have already identified huge savings for the public from the public purse, reducing the foreign aid budget by nine billion pounds, getting out of the EU to rid ourselves of those enormous net contributions, scrapping the HS2 vanity project, and moving to equalize per capita public spending in Scotland with that in England. And we will identify further savings too in our manifesto. Uh, our willingness to take the ax to these politically correct spending programs me means we are the one party that can stick to the Treasury deficit elimination plan while also delivering for taxpayers and for the users of key public services too. So we will pump three billion a year extra into the NHS and we will increase defense spending as well. Um, I would have hoped to see the other parties welcome our extra money for the NHS, uh, but they fail to match us. David Cameron 
isn't promising any extra funds at all. Uh, he once claimed his political priorities could be summed up in three letters, uh, and he said that those were NHS. Uh, half, a billion, half a trillion pounds worth of extra debt later, it turns out that they were IOU. Uh, and Labour claims to be planning to spend an extra 2.5 billion on the NHS, and I've got two observations about that. Uh, firstly, it's not as much. And second, it seems to be financed from yet another trip to the magic money tree that Ed Miliband must keep at the bottom of his garden. But, but because we have identified cuts, we can also go further than the other parties in giving working people a better deal. Because we do not only believe in Britain, we believe in liberating the talents of the British people too. So the Lib Dems and Tories say they will raise the personal tax allowance to 12,500. But they need to get to at least 13,000, even with lower inflation forecasts, to be able to claim they are taking minimum wage workers out of income tax. And that is something we are determined to do. And when I stood up at our conference in Doncaster in September, I also spoke up for all those people who've been dragged into the 40% tax rate by Gordon Brown, Alistair Darling, and George Osborne. I said that 40% tax should not apply until people were earning 55,000 uh, pounds. Less than a week later, David Cameron suddenly remembered the 40p payers after spending the whole parliament hammering them and said the, the threshold would go up under a future Conservative government to 50,000. Uh, though he couldn't say how he would fund that, and it seems like he's not willing to uh, pledge to deliver it, deliver it until 2020. Uh, and at Doncaster, I said a UKIP administration would abolish inheritance tax altogether. Uh, and soon afterwards, Mr. Cameron began dropping hints that the Tories planned to raise the threshold in the next parliament, despite having failed to enact exactly that pledge for the current parliament. Uh, at Doncaster too, I propose that a Treasury Commission be set up to design a charge relating to turnover that could serve as a reserve power imposing a floor rate of tax uh, where large multinational businesses have been aggressively and consistently dodging their fair share of tax. George Osborne even came up with his own version of that in the autumn statement as well, his so-called diverted profits tax. Uh, he now says to expect more such measures in the budget next month, and I welcome that. Norman Lamont once said that the Tories under John Major gave the impression of being in office but not in power. Well, under David Cameron's premiership, it sometimes feels like UKIP is in power but not in office. <laughs> and so here we are then, 10 weeks from polling day and right in contention in dozens and dozens of seats across the country. Peak UKIP was supposed to have occurred last May, but Douglas Carswell and then Mark Reckless helped our people's army conquer new summits after that. And I think that Labour probably woke up to the threat that we posed even later than the Tories did. They were utterly astounded by the performance of John Bickley in the Haywood and Middleton by-election. And I'll tell you what, they'll be even more astounded when they wake up on May the 8th and John has taken their neglected heartland seat from them. Yeah. Because working people know that this Labour Party is not the one they grew up revering, far from it. 
What we now have is a Labour Party that actually despises the values of working people. Remember M Emily Thornberry's mocking tweet about the man with a white van and some England flags on his house. Ed Miliband claimed after that that he actually feels respect whenever he sees a white van. Uh, perhaps, I, I think perhaps he should knock on the driver's window and ask for some tutorials on how to eat a bacon sandwich. <laughs> and then there's Tristan Hunt sneering about the role of nuns in teaching. You can imagine how well that went down among Catholic voters for whom the Labour Party was once a natural port of call. And have you noticed how Andy Burnham, that one-time ultra-Blairite smoothie, seems to be trying to reinvent himself as Andy Cap, working-class hero. <laughs> now, it may just be me, but to my ears, he even seems to have a more discernible northern accent these days. Well, Andy, you clearly fancy yourself as the next leader, so I've got a message for you. You get busy flattening your vowels while UKIP gets busy flattening the Labour Party. <laughs> because we can do this, my fellow UKIPers, we really are on the brink of making more political history. Um, Along with many MEPs, I've travelled around the country to many of our target seats. You know, particularly in the eastern region, I think of Tim Aker in Thurrock and Jamie Huntman in Castle Point, and I see what fantastic efforts and what brilliant political machines they have put together to take on uh, the other parties, street by street, district by district, ward by ward. And their dedication is such that I think it, it, it's beholden on every one of us to do what we can to help deliver those seats for UKIP because in first-past-the-post politics, particularly when UKIP didn't even get a single second place at the last general election, actually delivering the wins is one heck of a challenge. But we've made such remarkable progress over the last few years that we really are in a position uh, to do that. And uh, recently I travelled to, to Lowestoft, the Waveney constituency. Yeah. Uh, to help declare open the campaign office there. And I see Simon Tobin in the audience, and what a great candidate he is. And, and you go around Lowestoft, and many of you will have heard Ray Finch earlier talking about what the common fisheries policy has done to the British fishing fleet, and that is felt passionately in that seat. And I think there's a real appetite for UKIP there as well. So all over the country, if you, some of you, uh, we're not meant, according to the party chairman, to, uh, to engage too much in Twitter. Uh, but if, if you are on Twitter, you can't avoid seeing the UKIP offices opening up in constituencies all around the country. And we're the party that's growing, that's moving forward, uh, not the party like the other parties that are in recession. Uh, we can do this. The next 10 weeks will involve all of us really putting our shoulders to the wheel, all of us being responsible, uh, your leading lights who go on the media uh, must be uh, civilised in debate, understated rather than hyperbolic, uh, generous to opponents rather than ranty. Uh, we have a responsibility as the collective leadership of the party to all those candidates in those key target winnable seats. I certainly don't want to wake up on May the 8th thinking something that I did or said had made the difference that had cost a few hundred votes either way. And, and we're going to be talking about fine margins where we can win. Uh, I want us all to feel, when we look at the results, to be proud and to say that we all played our part. Because politics is indeed uh, a team game, but uh, every single team also needs leadership. And we're so fortunate in our party 
to have the most inspirational leader of all uh, in Nigel Farage. Um, Now, when you think what he's actually achieved uh, as our leader in the past uh, five years or so, his second spell as leader, it really is quite remarkable. Uh, it's worth restating um, that he's someone who stepped from the wreckage of a light aircraft five years or so ago uh, and did not walk away from politics, but walked back into the political fray. And uh, not many of us knew how much not many of us knew at the time how much uh, he'd suffered and uh, the problems that he needed to get over. So that was a very courageous thing in itself to take back the leadership of the party, knowing that he could deliver so much for us. Um, so he's someone who took us from being a party that scored 3% at the last general election, to a party that now stands on the brink of breaking into Westminster in a really significant way, uh, who led from the front at those promising early by-elections in this parliament, in Oldham and Barnsley uh, and Corby, uh, and on to more, even more spectacular results in South Shields and Rotherham, and of course, Eastleigh, Eastly, where, again, only those vote-splitting Tories kept us out. <laughs> well, I've got a message to the voters of Eastly, funny enough, which is, if you really don't want a Liberal Democrat MP, don't waste your time voting Conservative, uh, but vote UKIP, and there you will get UKIP. But our leader, someone who took apart the Deputy Prime Minister, the hero of the last general election uh, debates in 2010 uh, and touted as the great debater of British politics. But uh, our leader took him apart during two hours of live televised debate last year. Uh, our leader was scoffed at when he said that UKIP would win the European elections and then he led us to victory. Uh, and he then planned something even more and executed something even more audacious and successful at a time, I must say, when all the, the other people who'd been elected MEPs were pretty much out on their feet. Our party leader was busy planning uh, a coup de grace by bringing across to UKIP Messrs Carswell and Reckless and putting together, with a huge collective effort from our party, which I'm very, very proud of, putting together two by-election campaigns which delivered them both safely and honourably back into the House of Commons in UKIP colours. So no wonder UKIP's most implacable opponent in the media, now don't boo when I say this, uh, the Times newspaper, <laughs> few, <laughs> uh, decided it couldn't avoid declaring him Britain of the Year 2014. Um, and I have a feeling that's a title he's well up for defending in 2015 as well. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted and honoured to welcome to the stage uh, our leader and our inspiration, Mr. Nigel Farage. <laughs> 